This is Support is Sexy, episode 244, with Ann Shokit, author of The Big Life. Welcome to Support is Sexy. I'm your host, Elaine Fluker, entrepreneur, author, and founder of Chic Rebellion Media. Five days a week, Monday through Friday, I interview inspiring women entrepreneurs who share their wins and their lessons to help you take your business and your life to the next level and create something sexy. Here we go. Hi, everyone. Welcome to a new episode of Support is Sexy. I'm so excited to have you here. It just would not be the same without you. And I'm so excited to have our guest today, Ann Shokit, who is the author of The Big Life. Embrace your mess, work your side hustle, find a monumental relationship, and become the badass babe you were meant to to be. That is her new book. It's fantastic. I have read it. It is targeting millennials. Or actually, I won't say it's targeting millennials. It speaks to millennials, but it speaks to every woman who is navigating career, relationship, the side hustle, entrepreneurship, everything. I love the book, the format, the setup, and that Anne incorporates all of those voices that I just mentioned within the book. So I know you're going to love this episode. I will warn you, we had a few technical difficulties, so there may be some sound interruptions in there, but of course you will be able to hear all the wisdom that Anne shares. It is fantastic information. So make sure you listen all the way through so you get all the good stuff. Some of the things that you'll learn from Anne on this episode are why the side hustle is one of the secrets to success and satisfaction, the lessons Anne learned on her way to the quote unquote big job, why she doesn't have a five or 10 year plan, the benefits of the twists and turns in your journey, why you must learn to embrace your mess. This is something I'm still getting used to. Also, the importance of having a life partner who is as excited about your career as you are. Why young women are leading the change in corporate culture and sisterhood. How living a big life is different than quote unquote having it all. And the truth about the Instagrammy life. Now, those are just a few of the things you'll hear about in this episode. There's plenty more, and there are tons of resources. We talk about a lot of fantastic women in this episode. You're going to want to find out about them. So make sure you go to supportissexypodcast.com. Go to the search icon at the top and just type in Anne. A-N-N, and her show notes page will show up with all of the information there, the resources that I mentioned, and a link for you to buy her book, which is very important. Buy the book and write a review. All right, so now without further ado, Anne Shokit. So Anne, thank you so much for joining us for an episode of Support is Sexy. I'm excited to have you here. I am so excited to be here. This is going to be an amazing conversation. Excellent. Absolutely. (laughs) So first question, when did you first fall in love with entrepreneurship? I mean, I don't know if I'm in love with entrepreneurship. (laughs) I'm in, I'm in love with this idea of the side hustle. I believe so strongly that incubating something for yourself on the side is the key to making yourself successful in life, in your job. Maybe your side hustle becomes your main hustle, but you. But even if you're working for someone else, you have to have something that you are doing for yourself. If you're in your job and you're not in charge, but you're desperate to be in charge, you put yourself in charge in your side hustle. Mm-hmm. If you feel like you have to just have this slog of a job to pay the bills, but it's not meaningful, you get a side hustle that's meaningful, right? And mm-hmm. Or if you feel disconnected from your community, community, you get a side hustle with your sisters. And that's, I'm a big fan of the side hustle. I think entrepreneurship is so hard. It is. (laughs) I I agree. (laughs) I think it's phenomenally hard. I've talked to women who run small personal brands, big personal brands, gigantic, gigantic, you know, big brands. And to make something happen on your own steam that can support you can have an impact in the world. Um, you have to, you get a fire man. you have to have fire, but that fire comes at a price, right? You, you are without a safety net. You feel insecure and, um, nervous and like the ground is shifting under your feet all the time. I think it's hard to fall in love. 
Yeah. <laughs> it's and hard I to think, fall in love with that. Yeah, and I think to your point about the fire, um, I know entrepreneurship is very glamorized now. It's very sexy right now. But the, to mention the fire, I always tell people you have to keep that fire burning, though, even when you feel like there's no oxygen. Like when everyone else is gone or when it's not exciting or the money's not coming in or things are hard, you still have to keep that fire going. It's easy to have the fire in the beginning. Do you agree? Well, because nobody else sees the world the way you do and wants it as bad as you do. And we're all hungry to have people on our team, but those people are there because they want to get paid or because they want to learn something or because they want to be in your orbit. They don't, they will never believe as you do. And so, like, yes, you need support, but you, the, the, it has to start with you. The spark has to start with you. So where did you grow up? You grew up in Pennsylvania, right? So I grew up, um, I grew up in the burbs of Philadelphia. Um, when I was six, we moved to Denver, Colorado. We, I actually lived just outside of Denver in a town called Littleton. And, and then we moved later on, we moved back to Philadelphia. I, I believe I am an East Coast girl in my heart. I've been longer than anywhere. I've been in New York City. I've been here for 27 years. Mm -hmm. But that little stint of living in Colorado was really transformative to me. It was where I spent elementary and junior high. And, um, and so it was, it was obviously like it was transformative growing up there. But to live in the Midwest, and to see the beautiful mountains, and people are so nice. Mm. Oh my goodness, people are nice in the Midwest, friendly, helpful. I'll never forget one time our car got stuck um, in a snow in the snowstorm, a really sudden snowstorm, which happens a lot in Colorado. Right. And people stopped their cars and got out and pushed our car up the hill. And that had such that has had such a lasting impact on me of how selfless people can be and how neighborly. And I think that it's not always like that. It wasn't always like that in Philadelphia, and it certainly isn't always like that in New York City. And I think that that I t take that with me, that sort of warmth and openness um, was really important to me. What would you say a young Anne was like growing up in Colorado? <laughs> well, um, it's funny. When I was, when I was maybe, let's see, 13, 14, somewhere in there, um, I had a really tight knit group of girlfriends, but I always saw a bigger picture. I always thought there was something more. I didn't know what it was. I didn't know where it was, but I just thought there needed to be something more. And so my girlfriends and I bonded together and we created a girl group that we called Women of the World. And now I don't know where we got the confidence to call ourselves women <laughs> at <Right>. 14. <laughs> <laughs> or imagined that from Littleton, Colorado, we could have an impact on the world. But that's how I saw things, right? I imagined myself at, on a bigger platform um, even back then. And I, you know, I have always felt that way about the power of women. Um, I didn't know it, right? I thought I was just, I thought I was just being badass, 14-year-old mm -hmm. girl. Um, but... It, it later occurred to me that the seeds were planted all the way back then. What do you think it was about you, or, or maybe more so, what do you think it was in your life at that time that led you to know that you could be sort of a little rebel? Did, were you seeing that around you, or was it just something in you? I mean, my goodness, I don't know. You know, my dad is an entrepreneur mm -hmm. and always looking for a new angle, a new idea, um, some new place to make his mark. And my mom was a little bit of a rebel for her time. She got married later than her friends. She had a career, um, you know, or when a lot of her friends were just getting married out of college or getting married out of high school. And we, I think they taught me that there's... Um, you know that there's something to be said for carving your own path, but not always, um, not always following the status quo or the group. And um, plus, it was the '80s, and there were all these amazing, you know, badass chicks: Pat Benatar, Madonna, and Joan Jett. Right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Those those were the women that we wanted to be like. Right, Madonna, Janet Cindy Jackson. Lopper, I've exactly. been listening. So, yes, right, and it was it was. Um, it was about being um, expressive and individual and not about fitting in and about being a rebel. 
in some way. So that really, that really sunk in with me. That really sunk in. What were you saying? You were about to say you've been listening to, were you going to say one of those ladies? Well, so Janet Jackson, I've been listening to a lot of the uh, Janet Jackson station on Pandora. Uh huh. After, after Nasty got a little bump last year, I dialed into that station. Right. And <laughs> I am suddenly transported. It's 90s R&B <laughs> right. on that station. But I am suddenly transported back to like 21-year-old Anne Choquette in on the Lower East Side in Manhattan, right out of college with my girlfriends listening to um, and Vogue and SWV yes. and, and, uh, and it's a total it's an it's another it's another era of um, of girl power right but that is a really specific really um, really transformative moment it's so interesting how music can transport us in those ways I know um, I was actually speaking to my mom the other day after the terrible incident in Manchester and uh, we were talking about Ariana Grande and the young girls going to see her and I was reminding my mom of her taking me my first concert I believe was a Cindy Lauper concert so it's interesting that we're talking but I remember that moment and being excited I believe it was in Long Island it was just a whole a whole thing but I talked about just that experience and how music sort of means so much to us in those moments and you know what is so interesting about Cindy is she has actually had a long legendary career where she has she has pivoted and reinvented herself and opened new chapters and recreated herself and yet always kind of has that thread of, of who she was back in the day. Right. I'm, I'm actually really inspired by her yeah. and her, her journey. So for you, when you, I know you studied um, creative writing in English or got a degree in English and creative writing at NYU, did you always know that you wanted to work in the magazine industry or what was your idea after college? No, I thought I was going to write novels. I thought I was going to be a mm. fiction writer. That's and and it, and God bless my parents for not telling me that um, that was going to be a path to loneliness and financial ruin. <laughs> I don't know why they let me go to such an expensive private college at NYU and not make me figure out how to make money. But I had that epiphany on my own, uh, and somewhere in the middle of my junior year, I was like, "Hey." how am I going to pay my rent? <laughs> and I did not, I really did not want to move out of New York city. I loved New York. It was, it is, it is um, everything to me. And so I, I decided that's when I decided to get into magazine journalism. I popped over to the journalism department, signed myself up for a magazine writing class and um, figured out how I was going to turn what I was good at as a writer into something where I would actually get paid. Right. Now, one of the stories that you share in your book, The Big Life, which I love and we're going to talk about, but you talk about the story where um, you were going for a position as editor in chief and the three times that you or at least three times you share in a book that you went for it. And I wanted you to just share that story, those stories with us and, and what those experiences taught you once you rose to that level where you were in a position to go for the editor in chief job or launching a new magazine, I think was one of them. Yeah, so I never had a grand plan to be editor-in-chief of a magazine. I just wanted to try new things. And the good news about the magazine business is you try something new, it works, it doesn't work, whatever it is, it's over in six weeks because that's the life cycle of creating an issue. Um, and so um, I never really had a grand plan. I just wanted to be engaged and have a good time. But there was a moment I had sort of built up enough seniority and credibility um, in my career, and I was executive editor at, at that time, executive editor at Cosmo Girl, and I had a magazine idea. I had an idea for a new magazine. All of a sudden, the opportunity presented itself. It was like a big bright light, and all of the all of the world started to sort of shine the spotlight on my idea and I couldn't keep it to myself anymore. Mm -hmm. And so I spent weeks trying to put the idea together. I had, um, I had competitive analysis spread out on my floor. I went and looked at everybody else's magazine, cut out pages, ripped out advertising. I pitched it to my boss who pitched it to her. And that's a really important piece is because when you're trying, it's not always a great idea to 
cut your boss out of the way. Even if where you're going is not to work for her or him anymore, I needed that woman. I needed my, my boss to be on my side, to be my champion. Mm-hmm. So I finally got up to the big boss's office, made my pitch, so nervous. I was shaking. Note cards were shaking my hands. I like, could barely, you know, I could barely get two sentences out in a row. She said to me, calm down. Just tell the story. <sighs> okay. So I, so I got, I got through the pitch. She said, oh, this is a really interesting idea. Let's workshop it around. And so we did for a couple of weeks. It didn't go. It wasn't in the business plan. It wasn't going to happen. I mean, it was a, it was a sad moment for me to realize it wasn't going to happen, wasn't going to materialize. But it was the first time that I felt, oh, wait, I think I'd like to be in charge of a magazine one day. I really think I could do it. You sort of got a taste of so, it. So I could see, you know, so many women tell me that they want to be editor in chief one day. And I think that's amazing to have goals and to be that clear about where you're going. But I also think that, like, you have no idea what will happen to you between now and then and all the steps along the way that are going to prepare you for that job. I didn't know that I wanted to be editor-in-chief of a magazine until I was close enough to the top to see what the job looked like and to understand what it entailed and how I could bring something to bear to that role. And I think that um, you, I didn't have this long vision. I didn't know where I was going until I was there. And then I thought I could see what came next. And that's how, that's sort of how I feel about moving forward. I'm always just looking for like, what's the next big new opportunity? I don't have a five-year plan. I don't have a 10-year plan. Um, I am just trying to figure out how to take what I have and move it, move the line forward. Is that the same as, um, would you say it's the same as living in the moment or is it um, living in the moment, looking ahead, but not like you said, planning so far out for young women who are listening, who are trying to figure out or who are trying to cope with this uh, idea that they should have a five year plan or a 10 year plan and that kind of thing? What kind yeah, of I think the fight. I think the five-year plan really hampers your progress. If you're too locked into one vision, one idea of the way things should be, you miss a lot of twists and turns along the way that could take you down an interesting path. I don't think it's quite living in the moment because I think you need to have a little bit more of a strategy Mm -hmm. around your career and understand what you have to offer. But I think it's about looking for opportunities and looking for adventure and Being okay with the idea that you don't have it all buttoned up and you don't know how things are going to go, but you have trust and faith in yourself that you will figure it out, that you are strong enough and smart enough to figure it out. One of the things you mentioned in your book, The Big Life, is this idea of embracing your mess. I love that. Oh, man. Because it's so messy. Are you embracing your mess? I am embracing my mess, Anne. <laughs> <I am. laughs> but some days you feel like it's a little, oh, I don't, not too messy, but you just, I would say, let me speak for myself. Some days I wonder if my mess is bigger than everyone else's, or maybe some days it just feels like that. But then, like you say, you got to embrace it and keep moving and knowing you'll come out on the other side of it. A big life is a messy life. It is hard to do big things. And in order to make big opportunities come your way, you have to say yes to everything. You have to work hard. You have to look under every rock. You have to be at every cocktail party, working event. And then you have to go to every after party because that's where the good stuff happens. And then you got to be up in the morning for your meeting all bright eyed the next day. You know, that is going to make your life a frantic mess. Deadlines that have to happen, side hustles, projects, um, all the, and all, all the other, you know, not, not even to mention all the personal things that have to get happened, laundry, feeding yourself, right? All of those terrible things right. that, oh, not terrible, but like they could go, you could go very awry. Um, and so like, I just think that the more you try to make your mess fit into neat and orderly boxes, the more you're going to crush your mojo, that the mess is actually momentum mm. that's moving you forward and closer to your dream. And you have to to, you have to welcome the mess and embrace the mess. Now, there are moments that the mess can sabotage you, right? Mm-hmm. You can't constantly be in a state of panic. You can't constantly, um, oh, you can't be up at three o'clock in the morning every night for months on end. You can't, your mess can't be pulling you away from your dream. Mm-hmm. But you have to make room in your life for mess. 
Do you feel like that's what you did when you were going back to going for the position? You went for it a second time. And I know you said someone else um, got it at that time. And then you finally went for it the third time. But during that time, were you embracing, okay, um, you know, things aren't working out as I thought they would or that kind of thing? Or what were you what were you feeling at that time? Do you remember? So the, the, by the time I got the call to be editor-in-chief of Seventeen, the, to pitch for it, I actually almost didn't pitch. I almost didn't throw my hat in the ring because I was 34, I was single, and I really wanted to have a partner. And I was dating a lot. I was, I was, I was saying yes to everything. You were having a good right? time. I was like... I was having a good time. I went to all the I went to all the coffees and all the dinners and all the parties and um, and it was fun. It was fun, but it it wasn't the partner that I wanted to have in my life. And I remember feeling really as I was about to um, make a pitch for the editor at seventeen, and I uh, had a moment of panic where I thought, wait, if I take this job, will I never? find a husband? Will I never find a partner? Will I be too busy to have dinners? Will I be too busy to go to parties where I may meet someone? Will men be intimidated by me? Um, and a lot of my friends around the time said, oh yeah, men are going to be intimidated by you. And yes, you will be too busy. But my best girlfriend said the thing to me that mattered the most. And she said, well, the dating you're doing now isn't really working. So why don't you go for the job and then worry about the men <laughs> right. and then worry about dating later? And so that's what I did. Um, I went for the job, uh, scored that scored that gig, landed it on the third try. And then after um, after about eight months on the job, when my hair stopped being on fire every minute, mm-hmm. and I was able to actually go out once in a while. <laughs> Um, that's when I met the man who became my husband that, um, and I, it turns out, I didn't know it at the time, but it turns out I felt like I had something to prove to myself that I needed to make decisions. I think that's right. I, you know, I mean, it's a lot of magic that goes into finding the person who's right for you. Mm -hmm. But when I met my husband, Richard, my husband now, when I met him, he got excited about my job and excited about me and my ambition and my dreams and my goals. And I got excited about his too. And I think that, um, I think had I not gone for that job, uh, we wouldn't have connected in that way. Because I had to prove something to myself. I had to prove that I could do it. And I needed to make decisions on my own for a long time. Um, you know, you, before you make decisions with someone else about how your life is going to go, you got to make a lot of decisions about for yourself about how your life is going to go. Right. So you come to the relationship not as a different person, but just with a different amount of experience. Yes. Mm-hmm. Right. Absolutely. So would you say the big life then is for young women who feel stuck or women who are on their way? Or would you say both? So, frankly, I think the big life is for everyone. But I'll tell you this. The title of the book came from the conversations that I had with young women. So for the last uh, two years or a little bit more, I had a series of dinners at my apartment. I called them the Badass Babes Dinners. I love that. Because the, yeah, these <laughs> were the kind of chicks that you would want to have in your orbit, right? Chicks who were confident and game-changing and rule-breaking. And it would be six or eight women around my table. And... I would always start with the same question. If I could solve any problem for you, what would it be? And again and again and again, the same answers came up over and over. How do I find a partner who honors my ambition? How do I find a career that feels like a passion? How do I get respect for my bosses? How will I have to take my foot off the gas of my career when I have children? And... Um, will all the struggle be worth it? And so those are the things that, those were the itchy emotions that were keeping young women up at night. But they said to me, I know I want to do something big. I might not know what it is, but I want to do something big. And that's where the big life came from. Mm -hmm. This idea that here were smart, talented, capable women who 
who maybe didn't know exactly how they were going to make their mark on the world, but they knew they, they could do it. They knew they wanted to do it. So that's where the big life comes from. And I feel like in the book, you sort of give young women or women all, overall, because I loved it too, and I'm not a young woman anymore. I'm in the middle. But um, <laughs> I love that you give us um, sort of permission to go after the big life. And then as we talked about already, that it can be messy and that there will be failures, but you can still create it in your own way. It doesn't have to look a certain way. The, this is a mistake that a lot of people make. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm glad you brought it up that the big life is not the same thing as having it all. Right. Having it all is this dated idea of the way things should be, right? It's somebody else's idea. And it's like a tick list, mm-hmm. big job, hot husband, three kids, house in the suburbs. It's like, it's somebody else's idea. And this is about creating a life that's meaningful to you on your own terms, happiness above all else. And it's not about, it's not even about being at the top, right? I think so many young women think they have an old idea of what ambition should look like, right? It's the corner office with your feet propped on your desk and these fancy expensive shoes. But this is about finding the mix that feels meaningful to you and that will bring you happiness. And that's the big life. It's funny, um, as you mentioned, that image of, you know, sitting at a desk with your feet propped up. I feel like a lot of millennials are sort of in that stage where there's this old image that some of them aspire to, but then they know there's a new way of doing things and they're sort of trying to navigate both worlds. They're creating the new world. Exactly. That's what I think they is are so the inspiring. new world. We don't have new icons for what this should look like, right? I mean, we're stuck with these old ideas of like the sex in the city characters. Mm -hmm. And like those women were not particularly ambitious at work. They had big jobs, but they were not, they weren't particularly ambitious. And, you know, that's what single sexy singleness sort of looks like to us or like jobs like, you know, the devil wears Prada must be 10 years old at this point. I can't believe it. But I think that's amazing. (laughs) That's still what people think is this Um, icon of how work should go when you're starting out. And so young women really are struggling to put together a new dynamic. And that's what makes it so exciting, right? And here are the things I'll tell you that um, I think young women are leading the way for all of us. When they demand transparency, especially salary transparency, we all get closer to equal pay. The idea, this um, this idea of being free from the office, free from FaceTime, free from meetings, you know, that idea is going to get us to an easier conversation about work-life balance. How can we all have work and life be more integrated and work together? And uh, to be honest, the change that young women are leading that's most inspiring to me is the idea of sisterhood that they've replaced the old idea of networking where you were standing around with a glass of warm Chardonnay in one hand and a um, like a business cards in another. Mm-hmm. Remember those sort of transactional days yes. where nobody really made any meaningful connections. You were like, well, I hand out a bit of a business card. Right. Um, you know, that instead women are helping each other in warm digital groups, right? Hoods, where you are devoted to helping each other achieve and succeed. And that has been such a rewarding change. But I also think it's the it's what's happening to one. Young women are leading the charge, but it's we are all lucky to have them leading the way. What do you feel like you learned most about yourself during those conversations with the badass babes? Oh wow. You know, I I feel as millennial as I can, right? Um, I, f- I feel like we grew up together because we did, you know, I was editor in chief of 17, um, for the better part of a decade. And so we had all of those complicated conversations about becoming the person you're meant to be. But I think what I learned is that you are never done becoming, right? There's not this magical moment where I'm like, okay, great. I'm cooked. This is it. Mm-hmm. And, and I was inspired to, um, to have a fresh Um, adventurous outlook for this next stage of my life. You know, I spent 20 years in the media business building other people's brands. And now I'm at a moment where I am building my own. 
And that has been inspired so much by the women who've been at my table who are, you know, building their own brands, personal brands, right, of who they're going to be. Um, and so I think that's what I have taken away from them. I don't think I saw it that way at first. I didn't know that's where I was headed. What I knew very clearly when I left 17 is that I wanted to continue the conversation with the young women into the next stage of their lives, right? That this was a generation of women who had grown up with me. We'd grown up together. And now that they were in their 20s and 30s, when the stakes were even higher and there were no there were no guideposts or rule books and that they were writing the rules as they went. That was where I wanted to continue the conversation. And so, um, you know, very much like my usual process, I just put one foot in front of the other. Mm -hmm. I started to have the series of dinners. The dinners were transformative for me and changed my whole outlook on the way to give advice that instead of um, how to advice, it became me too. It became a sisterhood. It became a community. And the dinners took on a life of their own. And I launched a newsletter, right? I wanted to connect to the women who are, who had been at my table. And I launched a newsletter. And the newsletter became so good that I opened it up to all the badass babes. Everybody can sign up at annshoquette.com. Okay. Badass babes is what it's called. And the dinners became so important that I've now launched a campaign for women to have their own dinners. There are badass babes dinners happening all over the country. And so, you know, um, each piece of the puzzle was very organic. This was not like whiteboarded out in a in some big corporate boardroom. Mm -hmm. It's been, it has been personal and meaningful and it's been about what do young women need to hear? What do they need to know? I mean, frankly, I looked around and I said, well, here's what I think. Here's what's happening. This is what I see is happening with young women. Somebody else must be saying this. I looked around. Nobody else was saying it. And I was like, okay, great. I will wait in and I will say it. And um, it's that's what's been so rewarding about it, personally rewarding, um, but also been what keeps us on track, that I am paying attention to what young women need to hear. You're paying attention, I think is so um, brilliant, really, that you also ask them what they need to hear, as opposed to some books and other things that may have been out there or coming out, et cetera, that are just saying, do this, do this, do that, as opposed to what I think you did was really sort of get to know their experiences and then provide your insight based on your own experience, if that makes sense. We've moved so far beyond the idea of a magazine editor sitting on high delivering you know, words of wisdom right. to all the people. Um, this We are now at a state where it's a conversation. It has to be a conversation. Right. And the stories that other women tell are just as important as my advice and the stories I tell. I'm there to give perspective, um, to give insight as someone who has, um, you know, seen these changes and these threads happen and who's had a big a uh, broad view of the way women have changed but the women at my table and the women in my in my sisterhood and the badass babes their stories matter and they're the ones who are who are helping keep the connections everybody can read the book and find someone in there that they can latch onto who says yes that is that is the woman that I am following that's the woman whose advice I need and I love to to that point that you include the voices of the you know, some of the young women who are the badass babes, some women who are uh, more uh, further along, I should say, in their career, or they've launched businesses and that kind of thing. So all of those voices are included in the in the book. Who did you? Um, which of the women in the book did, resonated most with you? The founder of Rent the Runway. I loved her story. And, Jen Hyman. Uh, yes, and um, the founder of Learn Vest. Man, those are two powerful chicks. Yes, those two stories. I really, I guess maybe to being an entrepreneur and, and both of them, I believe, I believe both, I know um, uh, Jen from Rent the Runway talked a lot about relationship. I really, that really resonated with me, just this idea that she was going after that as passionately as her business. Isn't that amazing? Yes. You know, she, she was so open about her own struggle to find a partner. Right. And she talked about how, just a week or two before she was about to get married, she decided to call off the wedding. Mm -hmm. And she knew there was something bigger out there for her. And she took on that challenge of finding it in 
it was like it, would jo- it was a job for her. She wanted to put as much effort right. and energy into finding a partner. Um, Ale- what is amazing about the interview with Alexa von Tobel, who's the CEO and founder of LearnVest, we did that interview um, in about a half an hour, and every word out of her mouth was was perfect and spot on and exactly what you needed to hear. Here's a woman who is literally embracing the mess of her life. She had a huge startup um, that she sold for $500 million. And she's, was, she got married. She had a baby. She had a startup. She's like, she, she, she's on the Entrepreneur Council. Um, and didn't she have the baby amazing. like three days after the company was acquired or something? Yeah, <laughs> closed the deal on, on Wednesday, had the baby Maybe on, on the a Saturday. Sun. Like yes. really... Yeah, yeah, she's a force of nature. Yeah, I those, loved I loved her so much. Every word out of her mouth was like perfect wisdom. Those two stories really resonated with me. But again, all of the the women that you included, just hearing the sto- especially from women who are starting out earlier in their careers and remembering that time for myself, but also seeing how the ways that it's different for a lot of them too. Because I was just focused on wanting to be an editor or wanting to be a writer and wanting to work at a magazine because all of this that exists now just wasn't here. Um, or at least I didn't know about it at that time in the 90s. So it's just very, it was very interesting to see that too. Um, one of the things, you, oh, sorry, go ahead. Well, I think it's so amazing how vulnerable everyone was able to be, mm-hmm. that we that we were having conversations where there just is no where else to have them. You can't talk to your mom because she doesn't get the texture of your life. You can't talk to your boss because you can't be that open with her. Um, you're probably still a little competitive with the other women at work, your colleagues. And so we created this safe space to have some very complicated conversations about the intersection of ambition and life and emotion. Um, And I really am honored that so many women shared their stories with me. One of the things you talk about, too, in, in The Big Life is how to navigate the itch, which I love that because I feel like I always have an itch. But um, how do we how would you say that we do that at, at any age? And do you think the itch sort of manifests as a need for reinvention for people who may be more seasoned, badass babes? Yes. Yeah, so the itch is that feeling when you know there's something else out there for you whether it's in your job or it's in your personal life, right? There's someone else, somebody else, some other job that's better for you than the situation you're in now. And it starts out like a, like a little annoyance, right? You start to feel a little dissatisfied and it just starts to grow and grow until you're like completely itchy and you have to go. Um, and it's, you know, you can live with itchy for a long time, right? It's not it's not like an emergency, but it's worth paying attention to because I think the itch is the thing that keeps you moving forward and keeps you looking for some place new um, or something new and more to do. And I think you're right. It, it Whether you're at your first or second job and it's not right for you or you are a more seasoned exec and you're in a place where you know there's something else you want to do. I just had an amazing Badass Babes dinner with Gail Becker who has just launched a new, it's called Call of Power. Mm -hmm. So it's a pizza company with cauliflower um, dough. And Gail used to run Edelman PR. And now she has completely made a huge turn in her life. She decided that she wanted to be an entrepreneur and she's launched a new company. And I just thought to myself, like, that is a badass babe, right? To have taken a career's worth of um, credibility and to channel it in a totally new direction is a real inspiration for everyone. Totally. I need to interview her. That sounds amazing. (laughs) (laughs) What would you say is um, something that you wish you knew when you first started out in your career? Oh, man. This is a hard one. Um, I don't think I appreciated early on in my career quite how long a career is and how much the people that you start with, how likely you are to see them and to continue relationships along the way. I think I felt everybody that around me was very transient, right? I'm only going to work with these people for six months or eight months or a year, and then we're all going to go our separate ways. But it has turned out that the people who 
I came up with in the world are the same people who I still rely on today. In fact, I was having coffee with a woman the other day. And I said to her, I said, you know, you and I have been having coffee together once or twice a year for 15 years. Wow. And I said, I don't think of that first coffee. And I don't think it went so well that I knew we were going to be lifelong, uh, you know, friends and colleagues. But we trust each other. We have a career's worth of trust in each other. And um, we now are down to a place where we're like, what's happening with you? What's happening with you? How's your? How are your kids? How are your kids? And then we get to, how can I help you? What do you need? Who can I introduce you to? And then we wrap it up and we see each other on email and then we, and then we see each other in a year. Um, but I think that that's, a, I think that's one of the things you don't know until later on in your career that relationships are long and frankly, the most important thing. So to that point, do you think women should make sure that they um, honor those relationships in a, in a way that they might not be thinking of right now? Well, I think, I think being nice matters. There were a couple of times in my career where someone was not nice to me. And I, and I said, I was like, you know, there's no reason to not be nice. We're going to know each other for a really long time. And we're both going to be in this business for a really long time. So I think being nice and fair and candid as much as you can be is really important. But also, if you want someone else to show up for you, you have to show up for them. Yes. And and not because you think you're going to get something out of it, right? But because you are you are interested in what that woman is doing. You want to help support her. You want to you want to you know want to grow your sisterhood. There was a moment actually where I very purposefully doubled down on building personal relationships, where I had felt like so many of my business relationships were transactional, and um, and I wanted to go deeper. And so I did. And that was really purposeful. How did you go about doing that for people who want to establish deeper relationships? I showed up. I showed up for people who um, asked for my support sometimes when they didn't ask for my support. I made, um, I made an effort to volunteer my support and my contacts or my advice when I, when I thought it might be warranted. Um, I also tried to move some of the business talk into personal, you know, we, we, we're so, I am so shy about talking about my personal life. And I I realize that that's what makes people interested and invested in you. Right. And so, um, I really did try to try to make people try to on a couple of relationships to really move them in a deeper way. Mm -hmm. In the book, you say a great quote that I love. It's incredibly important to surround yourself with women who nod their head yes when you talk about your ambition. So that's end quote. So I wanted to know from you, um, what does your support network look like? You know, um, it's interesting. I never had a tight knit squad. I, you know, it was it was much more ad hoc. And the interesting thing is not necessarily your friends. Sometimes your friends are just your friends, right? They have their own things going on. They have um, they have their own lives, their own ambitions, their own direction, and it's Same not always family. those people. Same with family, right? Absolutely. But you and so that's fine. Don't try to make your friends into your squad, or don't try to make your family necessarily get on board. They don't need to. You need people who are you're bonded with to help you achieve and succeed. And so I have a group of women that I can reach out to. Um, and I wouldn't say it's, it's anything formal, but I, but there, there are connectors and insiders. Um, I got a, I have a couple of chicks who are on my list for as wing women. Mm-hmm. You always need a wing woman to go to an event. Right. And, right. It's going to, otherwise you're, it's too easy not to show up. Um, and so I have, there's a, there's a, there's a small group of chicks. They're all in different businesses. Um, and we interact with each other in different ways, right? Sometimes I'll see somebody at every cocktail party. Some of them are on the West coast. I'm like, Hey, call me when you get to New York. Um, some of them are people that I basically only see on email or on Facebook. Um, but we always answer each other's messages, right? right? Um, so that's my squad. 
One of the questions I wanted to make sure that I ask you is, how do you advise young women not get caught up in what you call the Instagrammy life? So really, especially when it's so prevalent now of us looking at each other's feeds and seeing what you think everyone else is doing that's so fantastic and comparing it to your own life. So I'm obsessed, first of all, with Instagram. I have, <laughs> this is in no way a call to arms to stop Instagramming right. your life. I love it. It's amazing. Um, I particularly am excited about Instagram stories and messages. This is it's a whole new it's a whole new thing for me. I'm I am obsessed. You're all in it. I'm all in. <laughs> but I you need to recognize when you're sitting there scrolling through everybody else's images that seem so perfect and amazing and they're on vacation and they're in love and they're getting high fives and promotions and they're going to fabulous parties. They have edited their life to look perfect, just like you're editing your life to look perfect and to not feel like that is the reality. Everybody goes home, takes off the makeup, and has to be alone with themselves and to and to feel whatever they're feeling, right? And that we and if those feelings are dark and uncomfortable and itchy, you know, that's real. You're not putting that stuff on Instagram, but you have to recognize that you are not alone in that feeling, that everybody is feeling those things. That's part of the sisterhood of the badass babes is for us to find a safe space to be honest about that stuff. And to have those conversations. Yeah. Absolutely. So in closing, Anne, if you think of your life and career and you had the chance to thank only one person whose support was critical to you personally or professionally, who would that be and what would you say? Well, I would thank my husband um, and because he believes in me and he supports me. And on those dark days when I come home and I'm having all of my dark, itchy emotions, he helps me get perspective on them. Um, you know, he, his, um, his love and his acceptance and his positivity and optimism, man, he is positive and optimistic. Um, those have all been such important keys to my success. And I didn't meet him until I was 35 years old. Um, so um, we're just at the beginning of our relationship together. But he has been instrumental in, uh, in my success, personally and professionally. Beautiful. And I know that um, another thing that you share in the book, it too, is just um, that you met your husband later and had your first child at 40, I think, and your, your daughter at 42, right? So again, yeah. this whole idea of letting go of what it looks like. It's not how I thought life was going to go. Right. I sure didn't. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm pretty happy that it turned out that way. And I think there's really nothing I could have done to make it happen sooner. But that also would have been some artificial timeline, right? right. It, I wasn't ready. Life wasn't ready. <laughs> um, and it, it wouldn't have served me. Well, what you're doing now looks good on you, Anne. Keep doing Thank it. you. <laughs> Thank you. So tell us how we can support you. I'll have links to everything we talked about, of course, but tell everyone social media where else they can find you. So please, first of all, buy the book, The Big Life. It's on Amazon. Um, I can't tell you enough how important that is. Um, you know, we need to have uh, we need to have impact, right? We need to show numbers and um, show strength in the world. So buy The Big Life. And leave a review. Right in, Write a review, please, an Amazon review. Sign up for the Badass Babes newsletter on annshoquette.com, A-N-N-S-H-O-K-E-T.com. Um, and also host your own Badass Babes dinner. The link is there in the um, sign up to host your own. I would love to see women everywhere having these kinds of conversations. And I give a guide for how to make those conversations happen. Excellent. And thank you so much. It was so great to connect with you and have a chat with you. I loved your book, honestly. Thank you. Support is sexy. Yes, it is. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> now, before you go, what would you say is a parting piece of advice from you to our listeners, or to young women everywhere? You know, the, I'll give a piece of advice someone gave me. Uh, I interviewed Barbara Walters and asked her what was the one thing that she wished she knew now that she... Um, that she wished she knew when she was younger that she didn't know until she was older. And she said the thing that has become a mantra for me, 
Don't believe that your life now is the way it's always going to be. You have no idea how interesting it can become. You have no idea the adventures in store for you. And so my advice is to keep looking for the adventures. You have no idea how interesting your life can become. Excellent. And thank you so much. Hold on just a second. All right. I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Anne. Make sure you go to supportissexypodcast.com. Just search Anne in the search box and you will find all of the resources, all of the women, a link to her book. All of the things that we mentioned in this episode will be there for you. Supportissexypodcast.com. Also, wherever you're listening, please make sure you're subscribed to the podcast. And if you love it, please leave us a review. It helps the show continue to rise. Thank you all so much for being here. You know that I appreciate you. And I have to tell you that this episode today was brought to you by Chic Rebellion Media. So if you're looking for content that truly connects with your audience, or if you're looking to tell your personal brand story, and we all have one that is truly unique, that really connects to who you are and what you want to represent in the world, go to ChicRebellionMedia.com to find out more. Again, that's C-H-I-C RebellionMedia.com. Again, thank you all so much for being here. I truly appreciate you. It just would not be the same without you, as I always say. Now, until next time, you know what to do. Go out there and create something sexy. And I'll talk to you soon. Take care.